This morning, it is my distinct privilege to introduce our commencement speaker, the Reverend Dr. Claude R. Alexander. Claude grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. He is a graduate of Morehouse College of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and did his Doctor of Ministry at Gordon-Conwell. In 1990, Dr. Alexander was installed as the pastor of Park Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, a vibrant ministry in that city with tentacles into the community and all aspects of Charlotte life. It is a church that has now swelled to over 8,000 members. He has brought a renewed focus on community and mission, instituted programs in global missions, counseling drug and AIDS victims, and ministering to youth. He works with government and community officials to address the Charlotte community's most critical issues. And Claude has been ranked among the 75 most influential people in Charlotte by Charlotte Magazine. He also, in 2008, was ordained a bishop by the Kingdom Association of Covenant Pastors. The last four years, Claude has served as the president of the Hampton University Ministers' Conference, which is the largest gathering of African-American clergy every year in the United States. In June, over 8,000 will gather in Hampton, Virginia. He is married to Kimberlyn, Kimberly, they have two daughters, and he is also a board member and the vice chair of our board here at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. For those of us who have gotten to know Claude, we have come to appreciate a thoughtful, creative, insightful, wise person. Claude has a great heart for God, a great heart for Christ's church, and a great heart for people. And it is our privilege to have him as our speaker this morning. I present to you Dr. Claude Alexander. I stand as a turtle on the fence post today. I am grateful for Dr. Jim Singleton's word on last evening. And as I sat and listened, I could not help but see the faces of many who have helped put me on some fence posts. President Hollinger, Board of Trustee Chairman John Huffman, Charlotte Dean, Tim Laniak, Layton Ford, former Charlotte Dean Sid Bradley, former Board of Trustees Vice Chairman David Rogers, who is now with the Lord, Dr. Haddon Robinson, Doug Birdsall, and a host of others for being instruments of the Lord in placing me on certain fence posts, I am grateful. The foundational and perhaps most important person whom God has used to do so is my mother, a psychiatrist by training and occupation whose practice was undergirded by a strong and tangible faith in God. She was my first evangelist and spiritual director who taught me the scriptures and demonstrated the importance of prayer. At a moment's notice, she would call the family into prayer without warning. One such occasion was the third Ali Norton fight. In the third round, she said, let's go and pray. I'm like, certainly God has better things to do than that. My mother loved the scriptures, and her method of spiritual direction for me was through the Proverbs. Yes, I learned John 3.16, and yes, she anchored me in Galatians 6.7, but we spent more time in Proverbs than any other book. She drilled uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 into all three of her children. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto your own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths. But, but sensing that I might have a future and being tempted to pride, she drilled the next verse into me. I can hear her saying it in the King James Version, 
be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. From her influence, I find myself often being guided by the Proverbs because within that book, it provides us instruction in a variety of subjects that pertain to living a wise and productive life, being a suitor, being a spouse, being a father, being a friend, being a worker, being an employer, teaches us on the matters of courtship, finance, settling of disputes. Whenever my mother did not like the girl that I was dating, she would always bring up Proverbs 7 and the loose woman. Within the midst of, of the writing of Proverbs, the writer drops a word that many of us read and perhaps pass over. It speaks of the absence of oxen, clean stables, the presence of oxen, and large harvests. The writer is seeking to convey a simple message to his protégés, which is that large harvests come only through the work of many oxen which plow the fields. But there is something that is unspoken but assumed to be understood. Having many oxen produces messy stables. And therefore, whoever would desire to have a large harvest must know that messy stables come with it. You can't have the harvest and not deal with the mess that comes with it. When I read this, I was quickly impressed by the fact that though the writer is writing to young men involved in husbandry, the truth that he communicates is as relevant to ministry as it is to ranching or farming. Effective ministry is a messy proposition. The unspoken but assumed truth is that there is no such thing as a mess-free life or a mess-free ministry. As you sit anticipating the, the ministries to which you now will assume or perhaps even grow in greater detail, there is the dealing with that which is messy foul and undesirable. Sooner or later, you will face something that stinks. You'll face it in any job that you work, any relationship of which you are a part, any ministry that you seek to serve. Sooner or later, you will come into contact with that which is a mess and understand it's not the devil. The mess is a part of it. We don't talk about that a lot in seminary. It certainly isn't included in the visions that people have concerning their call to ministry. I've never heard a person describing their ministry vision, including being shown the presence of dysfunction or pettiness or mean-spiritedness. And therefore, when individuals come into contact with the messy reality of ministry, they are often disillusioned, discouraged, and disappointed. They did not expect to be confronted by people who could care less about others coming to know Christ. They did not expect to be confronted by people being mean or uncaring, envious, jealous, petty, or trivial. They entered ministry like I entered ministry with a beatific vision of people loving the Lord and loving each other and loving to serve and loving to give. Entered ministry expecting cooperative spirits, pure and pleasant hearts, open and progressive minds. However, they were met with a different reality. Nobody told them about the unspoken underside of ministry, of people not wanting change or not wanting to change, not wanting growth or not wanting to grow. Nobody told them about the mess that comes with it. Consider the following figures from the Schaefer Institute. 
Out of 1,050 pastors surveyed, over 70% of them are so stressed out, burned out, that they regularly consider leaving the ministry. And that 35 to 40% actually leave the ministry most after only five years. 57% said they would leave the ministry if they had a better place to go. 1,500 pastors leave the ministry each month due to moral failure, spiritual burnout, or contention in their churches. And this is not due to their not loving to preach, not loving to teach, or not loving to counsel. They, they love preaching, they love teaching, they, they love counseling. It's, it's the unspoken part. It's the mess that comes with it. Seminary doesn't offer courses in manure management. <laughs> and yet more often than not, our time is interrupted and held hostage by manure management. Time that could be spent in prayer, meditation on the word, reflecting upon vision is time often spent managing whose name wasn't called in the announcement, whose program got left off out of the bulletin, who didn't get picked to sing in the concert, who felt that they weren't properly spoken to, who can't work with each other, who feels underappreciated, underutilized manure management. And when you find yourself confronted by that, and believe me, you will, you'll think, I didn't go to seminary, take out a student loan, go into debt, sacrifice time for marriage and family to prepare myself to be a shoveler of dung. And yet the writer of Proverbs tells us this is a part of it. It's a part of it based upon the subjects of ministry. Living things, mess. Mess is a part of the course of life for those in the animal kingdom. It's a natural function for oxen. There is no such thing as a mess-free ox. And guess what? There is no such thing as a mess-free human being. When it comes to human beings, mess comes with us on two levels. There's the physical mess, but there's the spiritual, emotional, and psychological mess that comes with us. We are messy by nature. We share a common nature that is, yes, redeemed, but it's still prone to messiness. The Apostle Paul speaks of it, doesn't he, when he writes in Romans 7 and 15, For that which I would do, I allow not. For I know that in me, in my flesh, dwells no good thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. The good that I would do, I do not do. But the evil which I would not, that I do. We deal with people who though saved from the penalty of sin have yet to be fully delivered from the power of sin, who have more experience with the fallen nature than their new nature. And at any time, the fallen nature with its mess is prone to rise. Everybody under the sound of my voice can be a mess. Look at somebody and say, you know you can be a mess. <laughs> oh yeah, you know you can be a mess. Everybody in here can be a mess. Everybody wrestles with flaws and failures, and everybody has triggers. Yes, the mess is a part of it because we deal with living, breathing flesh and blood people for whom mess is more natural than not. We deal with parents who get too angry with their kids, with workaholics, with couples dealing with infidelity and sexual dysfunction, with adults addicted to sex and to substances, to shopping and to food, with men and women who are being abused, with children who have jacked up parents, with folk trying to live a healthy sexual lifestyle. You name it, we deal with it. 
And God says, when you come into contact with self-righteous people who feel as if they're doing God a favor by associating with the church and who present themselves as superior to others within the body, God says the mess comes with it. How do you then reframe the mess if it's a part of it? How do you reframe the the foul and the stinky and the unpleasant? Well, I found out I had to do some research and I discovered that manure is profitable as a diagnostic instrument. Certain illnesses are identified and diagnosed by the condition and characteristics of manure. In some cases, you are not released from the hospital until you've had a bowel movement. It is not just an indication of health or illness, it's an indication of diet. There are certain things that are connected to what has been eaten and what has been drunk. The degree of water in your diet and roughage in your diet is indicated by your stool. And that begs the question, how's your diet? How is your diet in the Word of God? What have you been eating and how much and how often do you consume the Word of God? What else have you been consuming that would be indicated by what flows from your life? What have you been feeding the sheep? What's been their diet? What type of meal plan have you developed? Is it thought out or is it haphazard? Is it home cooked or store bought or downloaded? Is it the result of discipline, reflection, both upon the word of God and the people of God? Whatever mess our nation, our people, our denominations, our churches may be in is in part due to the diet. Consider the current diet prevalent in our society. Consider the elevation of the dysfunctional to the celebrated, the relegation of the wholesome and the holy to the basement, the desensitization to the horror of violence through the bombardment of video and virtual reality games that rewards one for being uber-violent. Consider a hypersexuality that has elevated the itch of sex to the level of ultimacy and greed and materialism spiritualized by a prosperity gospel that sets the affections of people on things and causes them to see their value in the possessions that they have. The marginalization of the name of Jesus to the status of one among many. The rapid disappearance of any and all moral and ethical absolutes and the relegation of divine standards to that of doubtful suggestions. With such a diet, is it any wonder why we face some of the things that we face? That is why time spent learning the languages, time spent in exegesis, time spent in spiritual formation. Time that you have spent here is so important because you are the deliverers of the diet. And God is saying to you that if you want to see something different, you must serve something different. That is the charge that God is issuing to you. You know, in my, in my, in my study, I, I discovered that the University of Nebraska at Lincoln has a whole section on manure management. And within the section on manure management, there's a subsection that addresses the value of manure. They say manure is a nutrient source and can be a substitute for purchased fertilizers. Manure increases crop productivity, can be used in gardens and flower beds. The organic matter in manure improves water infiltration into the soil and reduces runoff. 
A fertilizer is a growth stimulator. It is that which catalyzes growth. It increases the soil's ability to support plant growth. In other words, what it's saying is that messy situations can be a stimulant for growth. There are those who can testify that it's been in the environment of messy situations that your growth in God has been stimulated. Your growth in prayer is stimulated. Your growth in spiritual warfare is enlivened. Your growth in faith is increased. It fertilizes your growth in the spirit. You come to understand you cannot overcome it with just being as messy as other people are. You cannot overcome it with more flesh activity. The only way to overcome it and get through it and transcend it is through the spirit. It'll bring you to your knees, drive you to pass up your plate, and keep you in a prayerful posture like the fragrant rose that emerges from the soil fertilized by manure. You've got a prayer life, a study life, a teaching life, a preaching life, a worship life that has emerged from the soil of messy situations. And just as nobody can tell the mess out of which a rose emerges in full bloom and blossoms, nobody really knows all of the mess through which the fragrance of your life will emerge. They have no idea that the sweetness of your service was fertilized by the stench of a messy situation. Besides it being a diagnostic agent and a fertilizer, it, it's used as an energy source for heating and electricity. Somebody can, can already testify and you will discover that some of the uh, propulsion towards God, that which moves you to serve God fervently and to worship him sincerely will come through the messy situations of life. It's a part of it because we deal with human beings who by nature are messy. We reframe our understanding of it by realizing it can be diagnostic and stimulative and energy producing. But there's another point, it's right there in the text. One handles the mess of ministry by keeping focus on the ultimate concern. The ultimate concern for the farmer is the harvest. Manure management and removal are less of a concern. The farmer is mindful of the harvest. The harvest makes all of the effort of plowing, of planting, of watering, of feeding the oxen, of cleaning the stables worth it. The vision of a barn full of grain that can be taken to the market empowers the farmer to endure the stench of a barn where oxen dwell. Likewise, my friends, you and I must always be mindful of the ultimate aim of ministry. The ultimate aim of the ministry is the redemption of humanity, the reconciling of human beings to God, the transformation of men, women, boys, and girls into the likeness of Jesus Christ. It is the process whereby people become more like Christ and less like the world. It is to preach Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God, to preach Christ in them, the hope of glory. It is the aim of offering people holy and blameless in God's sight. It is the aim of presenting every man, woman, boy, and girl perfect in Jesus Christ. The presenting of people perfect and complete in Christ is worth enduring every bit of stench and strain and struggle that comes with the ministry. It's been entrusted into our hands and given to our care and what an awesome example we have. Because the one whose name we raise is our chief example to become the captain of our salvation, the bishop of our souls, he had to enter 
into the mess of our lives. He had to become flesh and dwell among us. He had to take on himself the mess of a human body subject to sin. Consider where he was born, a messy manger in a city called Bethlehem, confronted the mess of our lives for 33 years, being tempted in all ways like us, yet without sin. He chose 12 people who were a mess, mess people in messed up situations. Peter was definitely a mess. James and John, those brothers of thunder, they were an absolute mess. Matthew, a tax collector, he was a mess, but Jesus chose them and worked with them, ordained them that they might have power to preach and to teach and to heal and there came a time when he too was reminded that the mess is a part of it and he really did not want it in the garden of Gethsemane he prays that the cup might pass from him nevertheless he says not my will but thy will be done and he's reminded that the mess is a part of it therefore the mess of our sins he takes upon himself on the cross called Calvary there he is wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity and chastened for our peace and bears stripes for our healing he took on the mess of our sin every sin every stain every attitude he who knew no sin became sin for us he who knew no mess became mess for us he who knew no rebellion became rebellion for us he who knew no dysfunction became dysfunction for us he who knew no murder or lying became that for us and he did it because he had a harvest of souls in view he had a number that no one could number in view he had you and me in mind and so he died for our sins but early Sunday morning God raised him from the dead and he is alive forevermore If you were to go on a safari, one of the things that will amaze you is that the person that's with you, a tracker, can tell you where a certain animal is before you even see the animal. And I, it, always, it always amazed me how they were able to do it, but I, but I discovered how. They observed some things on the ground. That's an elephant isn't far from here. A lion isn't far from here. A giraffe isn't far from here. And the way that they were able to do it was by the manure. They're able to track by way of the manure. And whether you realize it or not, part of your testimony is a tracker tracked you and found you in the midst of the mess of your life. And he applied his blood to your life. He applied his righteousness to your life. And he has given you a call to represent him, to preach and teach and to counsel and to lead. And so the charge for you, class of 2014, is that you do it with all that you've got. And when you find yourself confronted by the mess that comes with it, that you keep your eye on the harvest. So that one day, somebody might say of you, I'm a turtle on a fence post but somebody found me and helped lift me up to the glory of God. Amen. <laughs>